Well, hello again uh, to memories. I have someone you're going to meet now who was the bravest man that, in my view, that ever lived. Um, you'll hear the whole story. It's a very sad story, but a very wonderful story, a very brave story, and something that had never happened before and has never happened again. So I want to introduce you to a man called Nando Parado. And Nando Parado was one of two people who walked out of the Andes after the football, the, the, the rugby team had taken off to fly to Chile. And it was a terrible crash. And a great many people died in that crash. But then some survived, but they survived for a very long time. Nando Parado, the man that you're going to look at now, was one of two people who walked out of that. And we we're going to have memories regarding that terrible event. Nando, you're one of my very, very best friends. And we've been friends for a very long time. And a big thank you for agreeing to come on to, to, to this wee show of mine. Uh, you're in Uruguay right now, and it wasn't too long ago since I went for the first time to your home and stayed with you and so forth. And, and first of all, you're in good form and good health with all this trouble that exists today, and, and the family are. Thank you, Jackie, for inviting me to be part of this uh, selected group of your friends to recreate some of the memories that we have had in the last uh, almost 50 years, 48 years. And uh, it has been for me and my family a great influence, the stewards all over these decades. And there are no words to thank you for what you have done for us. I'm now in Montevideo, Uruguay. The pandemic has hit us, but not as hard as in many places in the world. So we are free to roam around and keep a safe distance. But we are, we are safe here in this uh, small country, but with a very big, big uh, friendship to everybody. Well, let's start when we first met each other. Maybe that's the best way to begin here, because I was in... Uh, and one is Irish for the Grand Prix of Argentina. Uh, I was driving for Ken Tyrrell with the Ford engine, and I was walking down the paddock, and suddenly I hear this over the public address system, will Jackie Stewart please come to race control? Now, that's bad news for a racing driver, because it seems that you've done something bad out there, and uh, an official's upset about what you did. So I had never been to race control before. And I go up the steps to race control, go into a room and I said, uh, excuse me, my name's Jackie Stewart. Uh, you've asked me to come to race control. Uh, yes, yes, there's somebody who wants to meet you. And we walked into a room, Nando, I did with this man. And there was almost a skeleton of a man. Your eyelids were not there. Your nose was hardly there. Your mouth was hardly in existence. You, you were this thick and, and waist and size. And I was, of course, immediately recognized who it was and was enormously impressed by just absolutely, first of all, meeting you. And that was the beginning of a very deep friendship. But Nando, let, let us start with the rugby team and you left Montevideo and, and let's go to the point where it became a problem up in the air, if you don't mind. Yes, I was a member of a rugby team. We were going to, place, to play a game against the Chilean national champion at the end of the year in 1972. And uh, with my team, my family went with other family members of the players and flying over the Andes on a very, for today's standards, a very underpowered aeroplane. It was a Fokker F-27 turboprop full of passengers, crew, cargo. It was heavy, bad weather, flying over the worst place you can fly on those conditions. And the crew was not very, the pilot and the co-pilot very experienced. And uh, we hit some turbulence 
and uh, a few seconds later, uh, I am lucky to say that I survived probably the only plane crash in history where the, a plane crashes at full speed at cruising altitude against a mountain. We crashed at 18,000 feet head on against a mountain. Um, I'm here, I'm here. So I was very lucky, but the plane broke in half. Uh, half of the people died on the initial impact, and then the plane slid down a mountain for about a quarter of a mile until it stopped abruptly, like a Formula One car hitting head on a wall against the ice on a glacier. And that impact also killed more of the players and passengers on the airplane. And I survived with uh, injuries in my head. I was in a coma for four days, and of the 45 people on board, 29 survived the impact, which is a miracle. My mother and my sister were flying with me, they died on impact, and three of my best friends died on impact, but that was the only, that was the start of a fantastic survival story that lasted for 72 days on the worst place that a human being can survive. How long were you un unconscious for, Nando? I was unconscious for four days. They thought I was dead, I didn't have any vital signs, and my head was the size of a basketball, so they, they put me with the dead bodies. And uh, four days later, somebody saw that my legs were moving and they, they picked me up from that heap, <laughs> and I started to come back to my senses. And by which time you obviously were told that both your mama and your sister had passed. Yes, when I started to wake up, uh, you know, sounds and images started dripping into my, my brain. And uh, I heard these beautiful voices from my friends and comforting me and saying, Nando, are you okay? Can you breathe? Are you okay? We crashed, you know, we crashed, but we, we are going to take care of you. And then I asked for my mother and my sister and my friends, and they said, no, they didn't survive. They're all dead. <laughs> and that's, that's a moment that maybe I, I can relate to you, Jackie, in many, in many ways, because when you were racing, you, I, I relate my saga to some of the way you were thinking, because a lot of your friends died in those days. Formula One changed a lot. So you have to uh, separate the thoughts of suffering in order to survive and keep on going. And I think that on a racing car, uh, Formula One has changed a lot. In those days, it was different. You lost many, many dear friends, but you kept going. I lost many, many dear friends and my family, and I had to keep going. Why? I don't know. I cannot explain it. And probably you cannot either explain it. You just did it. No, well, I had many friends, of course, who died, and some extremely close to me. And I, I, I know I was with Johan Rint when he died. Um, and, you know, it was a strange thing. I think we shared something in this. Somehow or other, within 45 minutes, I was back in a racing car. And I had never driven faster around Monza in my life that, then when I did that, Ken Turl insisted that I get into the car 40 minutes after they had repaired the barriers that had been damaged. And I had just left Jochen and he, he said, you know, you've got to get in the car, Jackie, you've got to go out. And I went out, my second lap, I went faster than I've ever been around Monza and put myself in second place on the grid with a car that really wasn't that competitive. But I was in tears when I got into the cockpit and I was in tears when I came out the cockpit. So I was destroyed by it. And it still affects me today um, because of what happened. And it's the same applied to, you know, to all the other drivers who died that I knew so well. Um, but in your particular case, it's a, it's a much bigger thing, Nando. You were in an aircraft crash and you had so many people around you who were not only dead, but who were dying. And you had to survive that, Nando, and you and Roberto Canessa, because Roberto became a good friend as well, because both of you came 
to Switzerland and to Geneva and to our little home at that time and stayed with us for quite a long time. So we, we, we built a relationship which might be unique, it certainly is for me, in the, the, the closeness that we were able to come together with in the knowledge that all three of us had suffered death up close and personal and yet survived. And in your particular case, both of you became global heroes to the world. I mean, you went round the world, you met all the sort of heads of state. Uh, did you go to the Vatican? Did you, I mean, what, how did you manage all of that? I might want to come back a little bit to just after the accident and when you chose to try and walk out. But how did you handle the, let's call it the notoriety that you had, the, the, the presence you had of having come literally from death to be survived? I think uh, that um, my father was a great help. He's, he was a very pragmatic man. And uh, when I came back to my normal life after suffering all that ordeal, he just came to me and he said, Nando, don't ever look back. You're, the second part of your only life starts now. And you have to live a life. You have to live a life. And uh, I kept going uh, in the same way that I lived before. I kept on doing my sports, working, enjoying life, and uh, never had, because probably the pragmatism that my father inserted on me, I never had a, like a survivor's guilt that people say you, but you survived and your friends died. Yeah, and my family died. What can I do? I mean, the past is, you cannot modify the past. And the only thing that accounts in, in my life is the present. Because the future is, a, is fog, it's a dream, it's a challenge, it's whatever you can call it. But the only thing that I have lived through all my life is living the present. And, uh, you know, a few months ago, I got together some of my friends that were my friends since my first year in school. And I asked them, how do you think I was before and I am now? And, yes, and they said, you're the same guy, the same stupid guy that you were before, you're still the same one. So I haven't changed. People change towards me. So Yes, but, but I, I take you back to the Andes. I mean, yeah. and you coming round from unconsciousness. And within how many days from you becoming conscious was it that you and Roberto had the courage to, 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 to take off, to walk across mountains with avalanches around you, which affected you all? Uh, and how do you, just give me a little feeling at that time, with death surrounding you and continuously happening at that time, to, to make that move, to make a decision, to take a challenge onto an area that you didn't even know which direction to go to in some respect. Um, I knew when I came back to my senses uh, almost instantly that we were doomed. There was no hope because we heard on a small transistor radio that the search had been called off. After 10 days of searching, there's no way we could find wreckage of the airplane or survivors. The rescuers said, you know, the Air Force that were looking for us and the rescuers, they abandoned the search. So I knew then that I was dead. At that moment, I said, I'm not dead. I'm breathing. I will try whatever I can to get out of, the, out of here. But we were stranded in the middle of the Andes. So it took us two months there, two months to wait for the actual good day to go out because we had to wait for the good weather to arrive the summer. We were dressed with summer clothes. How could we attempt climbing 18,000 feet on summer clothes? And people were still dying during that period. Yes, 29 survived the initial crashes because we had the first impact, the second impact, sliding down the mountain. 29 survived, but at the end only 16 came out because people died of wounds, gangrene, you know, uh, infections, and uh, uh, 
uh, you're dying every minute there. I lost almost 90 pounds. So you die and die a little bit every day. But with Roberto, we said, I told him, Roberto, look at them, look at, they are dying and we are dying because we are the same. We are exactly the same. We have to get out of here. Come with me, please come with me because I cannot do it alone. We are going to die. And I said, we're going to die here, definitely. Maybe we have a slight chance, so come with me, please. And we waited two months to make the final decision. Two months. Two, mu two months in hell. Two months in a frozen hell. I mean, people think of hell with fire. I can tell you it's with uh, ice and snow. Uh, locked inside a small piece of the fuselage, about six meters by two and a half meters. 29 guys were living inside that for until some of them kept dying and kept dying. And you ask yourself, when will it be my turn? When will I die? And uh, I said, it was not me today. So, were, were, were any of the girls still alive? Any of the ladies still alive? No, there were only uh, four girls on the whole plane. And they didn't survive because only a mathematical issue. There were very few girls and uh, three of them died on impact and one died uh, when the avalanche hit us because we also had an avalanche that killed nine of us. So it was a very complicated situation indeed. So you then decided to walk out after yeah. how many days? 61 days there. After 61 days, I said, Roberto, Roberto, I'm going tomorrow. I'm going, I'm leaving because uh, there's no way we will live here for more than three or three more weeks. Three more weeks will be the limit. Why? Because we were surviving on the worst way a human being can survive. Over there, it's like being in Mars, Venus, or the moon. There's nothing, absolutely nothing. And uh, we had to survive uh, on the dead bodies of our friends, which is something people cannot rely to, but being the most important experts on this subject in the world, I can tell you that every single person in the world who had been there with us would have achieved the same thought and the same acts at the same time. And I knew, I told Roberto, look, we don't have any more bodies. What will happen here? I won't be here. I'll be climbing these mountains or dying on a crevasse, but I won't die here looking at your eyes. And he said, you're right, let's go tomorrow. And that's so, what we did. So, so you had already lost so much weight, Nando, and obviously Roberto must have lost a lot of weight as well. So you didn't have what your normal strengths would be as young, strong rugby players. But the fact that you were strong rugby players probably had more determination and, and I don't know, just plain guts. But how long was the walk? Try and tell these nice people who are seeing this now, who, you know, many of them much younger and that don't know this whole story. I mean, from, from leaving the, the, the crashed aircraft, how long did it take? And well, I can tell you that we had a map and we thought that we were close to a town in, because of the time the plane had flown and the altitude and the headwind, we made a lot of calculations. But one of the items on this equation was wrong, direction of the flight. Instead of flying west, the plane had flown south. So instead of being, we thought we were about eight miles from a town, we were almost 100 miles from a town, 100 miles. And I thought I would reach that town in one day, one day and a half, when we left the fuselage. So that day we left with Roberto, uh, we climbed and climbed, we, had, we were on a bowl, we had to climb all the way up to 18,000 feet, without gloves, without crampons, without anything. And on one of the most incredible mountain traverse histories in the history of mountaineering, I don't say that, all the climbers say that, we achieved something that's not human. We crossed the whole Andes Mountains in 10 and a half days. 
in 10 and a half days. Um, with I very little, with, with very little clothes on and certainly not mounted shoes on. No, I had uh, my rugby boots on and I had two jeans. I had a, a t-shirt, two shirts, a sweater and a very light jacket. That's my mountaineering uh, climbing yes. gear. And a small piece of aluminium, aluminium that I used as a, you know, to help me walk on the ice and on the snow. I had lost up to then about, I would say, 60, 65 pounds. We were rugby players. I was a second row player. But as you say, this is mind over matter. There's no way when I look back that I could have achieved that. There's no way. The only thing that made me go forward when I was dying, because I kept dying every minute, on every climb, on every step, it was going back to embrace my father. And I said, he's back home having lost his family and I'm alive. He was my lighthouse. And I kept thinking about him, kept thinking about him. And uh, that gave me a lot of strength. And in Roberto's book, which I just mentioned, I have read for the first time because he gave it to me that night I was with you when you had that nice dinner party and he came up to give it you know, to me and give him a big hug because just the two of you so many years ago meeting for that first time and, and uh, his words in it. I mean, I've, I had tears of what was going on at that time. I mean, the number of times you both must have been so weak with the storms that come into a mountain of that altitude and the avalanches that were surrounding you and somehow or other you both kept alive in such poor conditions and yet it was almost a miracle that you're with us today. It's a miracle. We made a fantastic team. Um, I wouldn't have made it without him and he wouldn't have made it without me. I, I was like a um, train trying to get as fast as I could, as uh, far away as I could, very, very fast. And he was slow and he was like a clutch, keep taking care of me and not letting me burn myself out. Alone, I would have killed myself. I would have killed myself because I never stopped. And uh, he was a little bit more tired and that was very good because we had to stop. We could walk for 10, 15 hours, 10, 15 hours nonstop and then stop and rest for one hour and two hours and then we kept going day and night, day and night. And we were blessed with uh, good weather because had we had a blizzard or a storm, I, I wouldn't be here. But, um, there are no words that I can have in my vocabulary to express how difficult that was. Uh, I look back and I said, it, I, I think it was not me. It was not me. And then suddenly, after all those days of walking, you saw green grass. Yeah, we, we came back to, after seven and a half days, the, the snow ended. So we walked about two more days on rocks and shale rocks and then suddenly in between the rocks some grass and flowers started to appear and that was a, like a fresh uh, strong feeling that we were getting closer to some life. Up in, a then, very, in, a, in a very remote area. Very very remote area. I mean no human beings have ever been there have ever been there. I think we were the first to see those flowers and uh, in, in that altitude, in those mountains. We, we never reached the tree level, ever. But as soon as we saw something green, we say, okay, we are getting closer to life. We are getting closer to life. And that gave us strength and we kept going, we kept going. Does grass, does grass taste good? What? Does grass taste good? Grass tastes good. <laughs> Robert, no, I mean flowers. Roberto ate one of the flowers. Roberto ate one of the flowers and he said, they don't taste very, very good. 
And finally, well, you, you, finally you, 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 you saw a human. Yes, after 10, 10 days, at the end of the 10th day, uh, we were almost at the end of our strength, mental strength, because physical strength we didn't have anymore. We didn't have any more physical strength. Uh, Roberto was sitting on a stone on a rock, looking to the north, and I was looking to the west. The sun was setting on the horizon with the mountains. And then Roberto shouts, I see a man, a man, a man on a horse. And I look and I turn around, and about 400 yards away, on a, across a river, we saw a man on a horse silently going back by on a horse. So you can imagine that we started shouting and shouting and shouting, and then the horseman stops the horse and starts to look at us. And that was the first link, the first link that we had with salvation. This man on a horse who was a person. So I, I ran towards the river, it was a river that was about 25 yards wide. And I started shouting to this man, but he couldn't understand because of the sound of the water. And, and you, would, you would not have a strong voice either. Yeah. He, 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 didn't, he didn't have a clue who we were. He, didn't, he later told us that he couldn't imagine what two guys were doing so high up in the mountains alone on foot. And uh, we communicated. This was a very, uh, a guy with a lot of common sense. He threw a stone with a piece of paper around it, with a pencil and a string. So I wrote a message there. I come from a plane that crashed in the mountains. I am Uruguayan. I have 14 friends wounded on the airplane. I need help. Where are we? Please help. And I threw it back to him. And he reads that get some cheese and bread, throws it across the river, and say, okay, now wait, wait there. And he went to look for some help, who was 10 hours away. So he, come back, he comes back the next day. So we had to wait all that night with Roberto there, wondering if he was going to come back. We assumed that he was going to come back. So, and that was, Jackie, that was, December 21, 1972. December 21, 1972. On January 14th, the Formula One Grand Prix of Argentina was going to take place. Every year, every year, I had been to the Formula One Grand Prix in Argentina, every year, for the, all the previous years, uh, even with my father and my friends. So when I came back to Uruguay, uh, five days later, I said, why shouldn't I go to a Formula One Grand Prix? I mean, that's what I, that's what I love. That's what I like. I mean, I'm alive. I, and that's why I went to Argentina with my friends. And uh, I had, I, I want to be very honest, I had two Formula One posters in my room, Tim Clark and Jackie Stewart. You know? Jim you had Clark good taste. Yeah. <laughs> Scott. And uh, when I was there, I knew some of the organizers and I said, is there any way I can meet Jackie? I don't know. He's very, you know, very, uh, very important man, driver. He's racing very concentrated. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how they arranged that. And uh, I think that was the first part of this beautiful friendship story. Because you invited me to the pitch and you showed me the cars and everything. And in one of your worst moments, the next day you say, if you ever come to Europe, come and visit us. And you didn't know whom you were talking to. So when I went to Europe, I rang you up and you said, why don't you come and stay with us here for a few days? And that's what I did. And here we are. And it, a few days went to a few more days to a few more days, and it was fantastic. I mean, and and you behaved so beautifully, both of you. And Paul and Mark were very young, 
I mean, here's Paul now, what is it, 53 years of age, and, and, and to this day, you're his greatest hero. But not just that, the fact that you, you both were just such good friends to have, because occasionally you went off, actually, to, to do appearances or engagements and came back and stayed and so forth. And you were there for quite a long time. So it, it was a great relationship. And of course, your motor racing then became quite an important part of your life because you, you were a good driver. You went to the Jim Russell Driving School, I remember that, just because you wanted to drive a single seater at Snetterton. Um, and of course, later on, you even went and raced at the Nürburgring, which is as difficult a racetrack at that time as there was in the world. 14.7 miles around, 187 corners per lap. And you've been there, you've done that. Now, some people might say that you're just a risk taker having coming out of a terrible accident like you came out of, and now you were driving racing cars. Not very sensible. Well, uh, yeah, a lot of people ask me that, and they say, you thought you were immortal, you could do anything, and say, no, 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 no. by all means, don't, don't think I'm, I, I'm a daredevil or, or anything. I, I, I'm, I, I have fears. I'm very afraid sometimes. I'm very good hiding my fears, but I'm afraid. And racing cars, my father was the founder. He, he created the Uruguayan Racing Drivers Club. You know, that's a, a fantastic romantic name, you know, in the 1940s. So I was born into the racing scene and the smell and the sound. And I loved racing, but I didn't dare doing it. I was, I was afraid. All the racing drivers were my heroes. And how do they do that, you know? And then I almost died and I came back and I said, what was the thing that I loved more and I didn't do before? And now that I have a second birth, I should do. And I said, I should start racing. And I started racing and uh, I loved it. And uh, I went to a dream wrestlers racing driver school. I took instructors here. Jackie Ta taught me a lot. And I became, I was very, very good, very good, but I was not exceptional, you know? I was very good. I was very join good. The, join the team. <laughs> yeah, I, I was very good, but uh, I all, also raced for the Alfa Romeo factory team the, you know, on the uh, European Touring Car Championship. And there was another driver in my team who was always a tenth or faster than I was. On the same day, on the same car and everything. And I, and I couldn't do it. So I was very good, but I was not, you know, exceptional. <laughs> and you've been on the desert as well, driving. Yeah, I, I, I did some, I crossed the Sahara Desert and uh, with uh, an event created by a car manufacturer. I spent almost uh, 20 days crossing the Sahara Desert. And uh, I raced motorcycles. I won the South American Motocross Championship in 1975. Then I started racing cars and I raced uh, uh, boats. So everything that had an engine, you, you know how it feels like, no, Jackie? I've forgotten. <laughs> and what about, I remember we went to Monte Carlo together to the Grand Prix. Yeah, I, I, I I couldn't believe that. I've been there with you a few times and uh, it's like memories of a fantastic movie of my life. You know, I, I, I live those things in honor of all the people and all my friends who would love to live those things. Is there anything, anything better for a Formula One fan or to go to Monte Carlo, staying at the Hotel Paris, sharing the room with Jackie Stewart. I mean, is there anything better? And uh, with my wife, Veronique, we have enjoyed those things more than anything in our lives. And those are memories. Life is to create memories because that's the only thing we take away. Well, we both have memories and we're both lucky to be here. And 
so many of your friends are no longer with us and so many of my friends are sadly no longer with us for the same reasons and where they are in the same place perhaps, I hope. But Nando, um, you've met so many people around the world because of Alive, because of the film, but more, I think, from the book. But the media attention that you got because of being surviving in such circumstances for so long, with so many people dying, friends, mothers, sisters, deep friends dying, that had to have some effect on you, Nando, surely. I mean, you, you man, you're a man of great strength, uh, and that still stands today because of your business life and so forth. But you, you met all of these heads of states, uh, and all of these kings and queens and the Princess Grace and, and Prince Albert and Prince uh, of Monaco when we were there for the Grand Prix. And they were more pleased to see you than you were to see them. I mean, they told me that. <laughs> so you must have made a lot of very good friendships along the world, around the world for all those years. Yes, I, I am blessed with uh, opportunities, with uh, having met very powerful people, interesting people. And uh, I, I'm not a man of uh, many, many words. I'm, my wife always says, how can you sometimes give a conference if your IQ is so low? No? That's, a, that's a wife speaking. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I, I have to sincerely say that if I look back in my life, in friendship and in feelings and what have happened in my life, looking at you, looking at the Stuart family, at Helen, the way you received me and gave me a house and they opened a door to a life that I wouldn't have achieved if I hadn't met you. Why do I say that? Because in all my business life, in all my racing life, not my racing team's life, I have copied you. I have adapted things that you did, looking for excellence, because if you do excellence, you get things back in a better way. I remember you in your Formula One team uh, putting the tracks on jacks so that the tires would have all the good gear, you know, logos on the same size, on the same place. And I did that on my racing teams, <laughs> you know, sponsorship, uh, public relations, uh, business-wise, a handshake stronger than anything. Even any contract you can do, a thick contract like this, I give a handshake and nothing can break that. And I have learned that from you, Jackie. I have learned that from you. And without knowing, I have adapted your way of life. I'm sorry if I did that. <laughs> I, 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 I'm sorry, but I have to say it. Well, Nando, it's been a fantastic friendship. You are one of, for me, the greatest men that's ever lived because you've died almost and lived with so much strength, energy, and commitment. And you've become now a very successful businessman because you've survived something that you would go into business with the same commitment, the same drive, the same enthusiasm, and the same fear of failing. And in that case, we're very similar in many ways. Uh, so Nando, your Veronique and your children, and here have I only in recent years had the chance to come to Uruguay to see you. And when you brought me to your various friends during that visit, I was so impressed. The love and the respect that they have for you after all those years, since that terrible accident occurred, is still magnetic. It's fantastic. So, Nando, I thank you and Helen too, because you know Helen's not well and she's got dementia. 
She knows that I'm speaking with you today and she wants to send a very big kiss to you. And she loves you as deeply as I do. Uh, and you know, when I see you with Veronique, with, the, with your family, I see almost a mirror of what it was for me there was early years of your children growing up. And when I saw all of these people with the huge respect for you, when you took me around and met so many of your friends, it just gave me a big lump in my throat. Uh, you are one of the greatest public speakers that exists, and you probably only do five or six speeches a year around the world. So the respect that they have for you, Nando, uh, I think cannot be more than I have for you. And I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate the fact that you've agreed to talk me through some the terrible times of your life. But here we are, both of us together, and still feeling as strongly as we were. And the very day that I met you for the first time was the day my father died. And that just was a terrible coincidence, if you like. But I'll never forget it for, for that combination of seeing you in the state that you were, Nando, and then having the bad news come. So we've come to the end of our little talk together. I thank you enormously for agreeing to do it. I can't wait to catch up with you again. And if there is a Grand Prix down that way at all, you're going to have another person to accommodate that lovely room that I slept in the last time. Nando, what can I say? A very big thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, big, big, big warm embrace to you and Helen and, uh, you know, Paul and Mark and their families. Um, when I think of a, a family that is not my blood family, but is my family, I think of the stewards. And I remember that day when I put my first step on Clayton House in Switzerland, a new life started. And it's thanks to the kindness and humility and the way you, you received us and gave us always, every time we see you, show friendship. And that's uh, one of the most incredible things that I, I have. And I, I always have in my wrist here a watch that says, to Nando with love from the Stuart family. <laughs> now that's very nice. <laughs> it's engraved and it says, to Nando with love from the Stuart family. What can I say, Jackie? Uh, thank you very much. One more thing that I'll say, that people watching this would, will have to have emotion for. When you left the last time from Clayton House, not the last time that we're together, but when you left Clayton House with Roberto and moved on, you did something that uh, we still talk about. You took the chain from your neck that was your mother's and gave it to Paul. Whew. That's special. Yeah, that, uh, uh, I, I got a bond with your boys. They, I looked at them when I was there and I, I, we bonded a lot together. And that chain was uh, my mother's chain. It was my, the, the chain that my mother was wearing when, when she died on the plane crash. And I said, what can I give this family and Paul something that is uh, something that means a lot to me? So I took it off and said, Paul, this is for you. He so, still got it around his neck. Yeah. So it's, uh, I mean, how can you break those bonds? They go beyond time and space and distance. And I know I can count on you. You know you can shout and I'll be there. That's <laughs> yeah. Nando, thank you so much for agreeing to do this and uh, for Helen especially because of the dis dementia thing. It's, you know, one in three people who live today will die from dementia. There are more people die from dementia than any other illness, but they live a very long time dementia patients. So it takes a huge amount out of a family's life. 
And Helen's going through that, but fortunately I can afford it because we have nurses to look after Helen. And that's why she's not sitting beside me here today. So, Nando, um, it's all part of life. And we've shared today an enormous part of your life. And I thank you very much. Thank you, Jackie, and until we see you again.